today on Market Journal. Adding distiller's grains as a forage complement might be especially helpful this year. The details are just ahead. Our market analyst tells us what he's seeing in the livestock markets and analyzes pricing opportunities for beef and pork. And if African swine fever wasn't enough, another pig virus is costing the U.S. pork industry over half a billion dollars a year. We'll tell you what it is and what researchers are doing. This week's edition of Market Journal starts right now. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine and the Gateway Farm Expo. I'm Troy Moling, and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Hey, it's our first show of November. It's going to be 2020 before we know it. And beginning today's broadcast, Nebraska's extremely high number of cattle on feed, along with its rank as a high producer of ethanol, provides the perfect partnership when it comes to cattle nutrition and the ethanol byproducts those cattle producers use. And distiller's grains are one of those byproducts generated when ethanol is made. Nebraska Extension beef educator Dr. Aaron Berger says conditions this year may mean you'll want to give extra consideration to using distiller's grains as a complement with usual forage. Yeah, so of course distiller's grains are a ethanol co-product, so a co-product of the ethanol industry. Been in Nebraska a long time, but really a nice complement to forage resources. Very high in protein and the energy source there is a fiber-based energy source, so really complements forages really well. So why are some reasons distiller's grains are something that a producer might want to consider this year, maybe more than in past years? I know that hay quality is an issue. I think especially this year where we've really struggled to get hay harvested well, going to be a lot of low quality hay around. So looking for something that can really complement that and distiller's grains with its high energy and high protein profile does a really nice job of that. You know, hay quality is low. There may be more corn silage harvested this year. Corn silage really does complement distiller's grains well, especially for growing cattle. The rumen undegradable protein in that, which is digested in the small intestine, really facilitates good performance on these growing cattle. And so that's an opportunity to utilize that. I think if we're looking at low quality hay, where we've had less protein than we normally would have, uh, that is an issue. And so I think people need to first test their hay to see what the quality is that they have. There may have been years where that hay would have been adequate in protein. This year they're going to be a little deficient. Also some of that hay may be more mature than it normally would, which means the energy available is probably less. And so that's where this distiller's grains with its high energy, high protein profile complements this low quality forage well. And then what about the introduction of distiller's grains and how that would change the diet of the animal, uh, the forage rationing of the animal, anything like that? So I think what distiller's grains does, if we're thinking about low quality forage, if we're short on protein, especially for a ruminant animal, providing the protein that animal needs allows the rumen microbes to do their job well and actually can increase intake on low quality forage. So what we're really doing is looking at providing what the rumen microbes need to utilize that low quality forage well. Do you have any recommendations on how one would store distiller's grains? Well, we've got some different options in Nebraska. We've got dry distiller's grains, which storage of that is really pretty simple. We just want to try to get that in a place where we limit the wind loss and keep the moisture off of it. Wet distiller's grains, we can do some different things. If we're using it fairly quickly, a week or two is not an issue. If we're going to be longer than that, we can bag it or tarp it, cover it, and uh, reduce some storage loss there. So really depends on your scenario, what you have available. Uh, these tend to be pretty forgiving in terms of storage, uh, but we want to try to minimize loss. Feel free to reach out to your local extension office for more on distiller's grains and you can also find some information on beef.unl.edu. Let's get a check on our markets now and on Wednesday I was joined by Iowa State University livestock economist Dr. Lee Schultz. It's a tale of two meats when it comes to beef and pork exports, we'll explain. And as we head into the final stretch of 2019, Lee tells us what we need to be watching, but we began by talking about the recently released cattle on feed report 
and the decrease in cattle inventory. There's a few takeaways real, really from that number. This is actually the second consecutive year-over-year -year decline. Um, and so we potentially could see the, the cyclical peak here in, in feedlot inventories. Uh, I think the next couple of months will, will tell us, you know, if we've seen that or if we do see a, a ramp up in placements and larger cattle on feed numbers. Real takeaway I see not from the, the inventory estimates was that when you look by individual states, Nebraska was down 7%, Iowa was down 7%, Minnesota down 19%, South Dakota down 2%. I think that's maybe an indication here we've had an issue with uh, harvest being a delayed harvest and that's having somewhat of an impact on placements and, and such inventories in our feedlots. Yeah, because when you're looking at placements, 2% increase uh, breaks the four month streak of year over year declines. Any more uh, info you want to mention on that? Typically, we do see the, the peak in placements in October with September being a significant ramp up there. Placements were really kind of in the middle weight categories. Uh, we've seen a few less placements year over year in the large weight categories, which should be supportive of prices short term. And then in the lightest weight, 600 pounds and, and less, we did see a slight decline. The only state being up was Texas, and I think that's maybe a bit of an indication with the drought conditions there. We've seen a few more calves move to market, but overall, I think there hasn't been a lot of pressure for cow-calf producers to move calves as we've had good forage conditions and strengthening prices. Do you think we've fully recovered from the Tyson beef plant fire back in August? It's very difficult, I think, given that we've seen several weeks and even months now post that, that event to really understand how much of that event is, is impacting markets now. We're seeing mar those mar our markets being driven by much more fundamentals. Uh, we, we certainly seen prices rebound, but prior to that event, prices were expected to increase as we looked at the futures market. So I think overall, I, I think the market is suggesting that we're pretty current in supplies um, and, and beef demand is strong. When we look at beef exports, are we still seeing that overall decline? We are, uh, and you're seeing it really twofold. You're, you're seeing it in the, the tonnage number, so, so the quantity decline, but also you're seeing a, a price decline too. So looking at it, we've needed lower prices to even move a lower percentage of beef. Now, importantly, we've really seen double-digit increase the last couple of years, um, and so I think it wasn't really sustainable to really maintain those levels. Uh, but overall, we have seen lower export numbers this year, and I think that's certainly impacting prices. What do you think we need to do to get those export numbers back where they need to be? Well, it, it certainly relates to, to the trade agreements that, that we have in place or currently negotiating or have been approved. Uh, we, we've seen really recent growth in, in the Japan market as, as we got that agreement in principle made. Uh, I think you know we have the potential to grow exports to, to Mexico and Canada more as we talk about the USMCA. Um, I, I think really when you look at forecasts, uh, this year may kind of be a little bit of an outlier as we're looking at forecast larger exports in 2020. And then when we look at pork exports, really a different story. They look pretty good, don't they? They do, but there is a little bit of disconnect, I think, between the data that you look at. The official census data, which we have through August, shows that exports are up about 5%. Uh, when you look at the weekly data, which we have that through October 17th, that shows exports are up about 36%. Uh, the disconnect being there is uh, that weekly data is supposed to kind of give us a, a little bit of a look ahead. Um, and USDA FAS came back and said they had missed some sales that, that were made primarily to China, Mexico, and Japan. Um, and so that really is showing much larger exports uh, that, than the, the monthly data shows. We won't be able to rectify those, those data really for the next couple of months. Uh, but overall, I think that shows very optimism, not only for China, as we've talked a lot about this year, but also the growth we've seen in, in uh, Japan and Mexico. So with all that being said, what does that mean for hog prices here in the U.S.? Because there has been lots of growth in that pork industry. What would you like to tell producers? 
you really have to look at the demand situation of, of where we are where we are at production relative to prices. So we're at record production levels. Uh, you're seeing growth probably about 4.7 percent in slaughter this year uh, for, for hog slaughter, and we're seeing about five dollar higher prices compared to 2000. 18. You can fast forward and, and forecast are about $10 higher prices in 2020 with an additional increase in production. And finally, as we wrap up, give us an idea on some things we'll want to pay attention to as we get into the first quarter of next year, and that can be for beef, for pork, or both. Cattle feeding industry, I think you certainly have to focus in on the margins that are being offered really for the first six months of the year. Um, it's almost a replay of last year. When you, when you stared at the first four months of, of 2019, you could really hedge a profit of about $30 per head for the average feedlot producer in 2019. Now when, when I look at futures prices for 2020, it's suggesting for the first half of the year, you can hedge about an $80 profit, and overall for the year, about a $20 profit. Uh, we haven't seen many years that have been in the black in cattle feeding, especially here in the la last couple of years. The markets are really offering an opportunity to offset a lot of risk. Same could be said for the hog market as we're looking at a premium prices in 2020 compared to 2019. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Scott Irwin from the University of Illinois. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Time for this week's trivia question now, and last week we had a story about introducing sheep to your livestock operation. So here's a sheep question for you. How many miles of yarn can you get from one pound of wool? Is it two, four, eight, or is it ten? Make your guess, and I'll have the answer after Al's forecast. Next up, Scott Wagner is no stranger to diversification. The Hooper area producer has grown seed corn, white corn, yellow corn, seed soybeans, and yellow soybeans. He grows cover crops in the fall and winter and backgrounds cattle on pasture and annual forage. But in his latest venture, he's taken on an entirely new production system, raising pullets for Lincoln Premium Poultry, to supply Costco's new state-of-the-art poultry processing facility in Fremont. Wagner's reasons for diving into poultry production are similar to those raising broilers for Costco, but he's always preferred to do things his own way, and ultimately decided to raise pullets. Read about Wagner and how pullet production fit his operation in the November Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. And wow, we had a cold end to October, Al. These chilly temps going to be hanging around for a while? Well, Troy, yes, it has been a cool month. In fact, much of the Pacific Northwest all the way through the Northern Plains and southward into the Central Plains has run anywhere from three upwards of 10 degrees below normal for the month of October. And it really intensified this week, of course, with the storm systems that moved through during this period. Last week we talked about the differences in the models and it looks like the GFS really come out to be the better model in regards for the total precipitation. It did a very poor job on the secondary portion of that system as it moved down the Texas Panhandle. It was advertising it to move well to the south of us and in fact it moved sort of to, similar to what the Euro was indicating. But most of the heavy precipitation laid well to the east of us. Um, and then we also seen some pretty significant snowfall accumulating in portions up the upper Great Lakes region anywhere from one to three inches widely reported in terms of uh, wetness, basically from central portions of Iowa eastward. So it looks like they're going to come to a grinding halt in terms of harvest activity for the foreseeable future. And then we did see some rather substantial snowfall accumulations, particularly in the southwestern Nebraska and along the front range down into southern uh, portions of Colorado where up to two foot of snow was reported unofficially. So as we go forward, of course, we're looking at the harvest and we're trying to figure out whether or not we're going to see some good weather. And we do have kind of a mixed mode here over the next seven days with a little bit better conditions as we go a little bit farther out into the future. So as we take an upper look at the upper area model, basically here's your jet stream pattern and we got the one system that moved through over the last 24 hours is now uh, intensified into the trough in the eastern United States and that will not be much of a player in our weather into the foreseeable future. Our attention draws to the west and we have a low pressure in southeastern Colorado. There's just no moisture associated with that dry cold air in place. Most of the snowfall will occur over the Great Lakes. Now as we get into Sunday and Sunday evening, we're going to be looking at a couple pieces of energy moving in the northwest flow that may clip 
the northern plains and possibly even portions of northeastern Nebraska, but firmly uncontrolled as high pressure, at least in the southern part of the state, as we start to see the snowfall spread toward the south and the southeast. Now on Monday, it looks like the cool air starts to dip and pull into place as high pressure builds into our region. A low is indicated to develop in the Texas Panhandle, but it is too, uh, development is too uh, short, short to be able to pull a lot of moisture up into our region, so it looks like the best accumulation will be across the Dakotas with possibly slipping into northeast Nebraska. And then on Tuesday, most of that wave moves to the west or east of us, and the high pressure firmly in control as it moves into the center part of the country. And we will expect some cool conditions. And you can see most of the accumulating snowfall directed over northern Illinois and Michigan. And then we see on Wednesday that we start to see a relief from this trough as it starts to ease up toward the north and we start to build some ridging into our region. Once again, another thermal low is expected to develop in southeastern Colorado with high pressure to our north. We start to move some moisture to the north, but not fast enough to meet this cold front. So most of the moisture will remain once again Nebraska border northward, and then that will shift toward the Great Lakes on Thursday as that trough redigs across the eastern United States and high pressure firmly in control. So we're going to be back down into the 40s, possibly seeing some residual snow uh, based across the Dakotas and northern Nebraska, but the primary emphasis of this storm system will be to our east once again, and then we'll be in that northwest flow with another low pressure system developing in South Dakota, but this one is expected to move toward the southeast and bypass Nebraska, bringing in much warmer conditions and drier weather particularly as we go through next week and in an early part of the following week. In terms of the 8 to 14 day forecast, that cold air in place with that northwest flow particularly emphasized over the Great Lakes, ridging to our west will start to build in, particularly as we get past Sunday. And in terms of precipitation, with that ridge building in, we expect drier conditions to be in store. So Troy, overall, it looks like we got a couple chances of precipitation, primarily mostly it will impact northern Nebraska, and then it looks like a fairly decent forecast for harvest activity. Thanks, Al. Back to trivia now, and this week we asked, how many miles of yarn can you make from one pound of wool? The answer is D, 10 miles. And check this out, some sheep can produce as much as 30 pounds of wool a year. Next up, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, or PERS, is a viral disease that has the potential to infect pigs. It can lead to pneumonia, as well as reproductive failure in sows, Plus, it's shown increased mortality in adult pigs and younger piglets. This has been a costly problem for many pork producers in the U.S. However, with a lot of hard work and dedication, an assistant professor in the Animal Science Department at UNL is hoping to make these problems a thing of the past. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has more. Well, thanks, Troy. You're absolutely right. PRRSV has been a formidable problem for pork producers, and not just here in the States, but the world over. In the United States alone, the cost of the pork industry has been an estimated $664 million per year. Now a team of UNL researchers are working to develop a broad coverage vaccine to help pork producers overcome some of the difficulties PERS can present to their operations. Hip Vu is originally from Vietnam and has seen for himself the severity and often deadly consequences of PRRSV when the virus struck his family's pork operation back in the early 2000s. That first-hand encounter has driven Hip to further his education and embark in research here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in hopes of developing a vaccine that could one day be of help to his family and pork producers worldwide. I grew up in the swine farm in Vietnam and um, up to 2005, 2006, at that time, like uh, we call PERS, is the um, most like um, dominant um, prevalent disease in Vietnam and also new disease. So when I was in uh, vet school, people were talking a lot about the disease and I saw that affecting my parents' farm as well. So like I want to study birth and especially like design vaccine or something that I hope it can help control the virus. Because I want to study birth and then I started looking for the university, especially the uh, professor, whoever uh, work on birth. And that's also one of the reasons I chose to come to Nebraska. Since the discovery of the virus, PERS has been spreading worldwide and is now considered an endemic in most pig producing countries. Now an assistant professor at UNL, HIP is hopeful to create a universal or broadly protective vaccine that could protect against multiple variants of the virus that are currently circulating. One reason the virus has been so problematic is the fact that it is very easily communicable among diseases as humans spreading a common cold virus. If you bring the swine that infected with the virus into your operation, then like you bring the virus in. And then like for example, truck that uh, transport pig contaminated and go enter to your operation, you can also transmit the virus. 
another source that people had been talking is like through air. For example, like the virus can be shredded uh, through the air. Kind of so very much like a cold. Yep, yep, quite similar. Keeping a close eye on your herd is paramount when detecting this particular virus. If you're suspicious of an outbreak in your operation, it's important for a producer to look for the telltale signs of the virus, such as discharge from the eyes and nose, labored abdominal breathing, or premature farrowing. One glaring sign of the virus is abnormal coloration of the animal's skin, particularly around the ears. So um, the clinical sign is variable um, a lot, but um, uh, typically you're going to see if you had the um, uh, breeding herd, like the south form, you're going to see like abortion. And we call late term abortion, mean that um, abortion happened late during the pregnancy. Uh, we call the third trimester, so after 90 days of preg pregnancy. And then you're going to see like um, increase in mortality of the pre-winning uh, piglet. And then like um, um, if you look at the, the south, depend on the vir virulence of the virus, but you may see the um, uh, bluish uh, color in the skin, especially in the ear. And therefore, in Vietnam, we call it the blue ear disease. If you can confirm the virus has made its way into your herd, preventing new virus introductions are unlikely. Management practices should be committed to moving towards stability by managing risk factors, both internal and external, to minimize transmission and maximize immunity. In the short term, your best course of action may simply be putting the herd in a quarantine of sorts. So, depend on the operation, they may do, for example, some farm, they may depopulate the whole thing and then redo it again, like um, buying the new uh, non-infected pig. But at the farm, they may choose, for example, they close the herd, we call it herd closure, so that like, you don't import new animal in, and then you just let the disease, we call it like, die out. So it infects every pig in the, in the herd, and then the pig got the um, immune system work, and then like, uh, eventually you can uh, hopefully um, stabilize your herd. And so you may still have virus in the herd, but it do not cause a lot of like uh, damage. So that's what they do about 200 days of closing herd. Do not bring any new animal into the herd during that time. To, because when you bring the naive animal, which do not have immunity to the virus, then those animals will be infected and then you're gonna have the virus continue going on in your farm. So one of the practice that the producer do is he, they close the herd for about 200 days, and then just let the virus circulate and infect every pig in, in their farm, and then the pig may get the immune system to work and it, um, it will be stable, hopefully. Hip tells me he's hopeful to have the vaccine completed in the coming years. In the meantime, however, he says there are other vaccine options available, but they may not cover all the variations of the virus. Now, this is something we're going to keep an eye on as his research continues. And in the coming weeks, we're going to provide you with the latest updates on African swine fever. However, that's what I've got my eye on this week, and we'll send it back to you, Troy. Thanks, Bill. The Gateway Farm Expo is the longest-running farm show in Nebraska, and this month it'll be celebrating its 50th year. The event runs from November 20th to the 21st at the Buffalo County Fairgrounds in Kearney, and it brings in over 4,000 visitors and 300 exhibitors. Proceeds from the show help benefit ag education in communities across Nebraska. Market Journal is one of the sponsors this year, and it promises to be a good time. You can learn more at gatewayfarmexpo.org. Finally today, and the crop residue exchange was started to help livestock producers find forage for their animals and crop producers to find extra cash for their pockets. This year, some new features were added to make it easier to use. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh has the story. As harvest season comes to an end, many farmers may be looking for something to do with their empty fields. Nebraska Extension Farm and Ranch Management Specialist Jay Parsons says one way to utilize the free acres is to sign up for the Crop Residue Exchange. Well, first of all, it started a couple years ago, so it debuted in August of 2017, um, and it was funded by a Nebraska Extension Innovation Grant. Basically, it was started because we were getting requests from people that were looking for people with cattle to graze their corn stalks or cattle producers looking for corn stalks in, in particular. And we had started doing a lot of work with uh, crop residue at that point, uh, cover crops that people were wanting to get people to graze too. And so, uh, so we just decided, well, let's just start an exchange where we could connect people. Recently, the exchange debuted some new changes, including an expansion to Nebraska's neighboring states. 
Well, the geographic exp uh, expansion actually started a little, uh, late last year. Uh, uh, some folks over at Iowa State uh, approached Mary Dronowski about including Iowa in it. And then uh, Will Boyer from uh, Kansas State Extension approached me and said, hey, can you include Kansas in it? So when we got that second request, we just had our programmers go through and basically add all the neighboring states. So that's up, up and working. And then the Save Search things actually came out of some work this summer. Uh, we were, uh, you know, just working with the programmers, going through um, the details and some stuff, and they started spouting off some stats on all the people that were searching. And uh, so we thought, well, shoot, we need to allow these folks to save these searches so that we can then get them notified if something comes up. While an account is not necessary to view what's available, you do need to sign up to contact the landowner. But Jay says the information you provide is minimal and private. The account information we kept, we wanted to keep this very uh, easy to use and not very intrusive. So basically with a name and an email address, you can create an account. And it's up to you if you just use your email address as a uh, uh, contact information or if you also want to provide a phone number for people. Uh, so for them, it's it's similar thing in terms of just what they need, but the contact uh, information uh, is available to them if they have an account so they actually contact the person and get a hold of them. When it comes down to it, the Crop Residue Exchange is a free tool that can be utilized by both cattle and crop producers alike. No, it's there for people to use. Um, if you're a crop producer looking for uh, you know, some extra income by leasing out your ground, it, and to be honest, there's some people that are putting everything up there from it's fully fenced with water and I'll care for your animals to the exact opposite, that it's just there and I want to rent it out. But uh, we have plenty of livestock producers looking for forage to, to lease. Um, whatever it is, if you're wanting to lease it out to, to uh, cattle producers, this is the exchange where you, where you should post it because a lot of people are looking. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. Thanks, Maddie. To find out more, list a field, or start your own search, visit cropresidueexchange.unl.edu. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, we'll tell you about some important meetings discussing the new farm bill, plus hear about the benefits of barley. All that and so much more. We'll see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine and the Gateway Farm Expo. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.